Hello, folks. My name is Rick Pearson, and this is Prophecy USA, a prophecy podcast specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. Now, today, uh, we do not have my wife, Karen, with us. I'm sorry about that. She'll be with us hopefully next week, uh, but she could not join us this week. We would like to thank everyone for joining us right now, and please, please, by all means, let us know where you're from. We're getting views now from almost every state in every province in Canada. We're also hearing from Europe, uh, from England on the INSB. We're, we're hearing uh, from uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, basically around the world, folks. So just let us know. It excites us to hear where you're from, California. We're in all 10 provinces in Canada and, and all every state in the Union we hear from on a weekly basis. We just want to thank you for joining us. And you know, there's countless Bible teachers telling us that the rapture or the catching away of the church is the next greatest event in Bible prophecy. Others are telling us that uh, since the October 7th, 2023 massacre in Israel, that this is a dress rehearsal for the coming Gog-Magog war. Now, most of us know that the greatest exodus in history was when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. But according to prophecy, a much greater exodus is coming, and it could be even more spectacular than the one in the Old Testament. So today, we are concluding our four-part series with Pastor Jack Hibbs, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and Rabbi Jason Sobel, with the topic, Are We Getting Close to the Rapture? Now, Prophecy USA has a very unique teaching, uh, because we believe that the United States of America plays a pivotal role in Bible prophecy. And it should be noted right now that our guests are not confirming that America is Babylon the Great. However, they've been gracious enough to come on our program and meet us on common ground with areas where we are all in agreement. Now, although you won't hear many prophecy teachers uh, te discussing the 53 descriptions of Babylon the Great, you do hear many talking about the Gog-Magog War and the rapture of the church, which is we believe, just around the corner. Now, prophecy could not agree more with these scholars except for one fact. We believe that the Gog-Magog War, the rapture of the church, and the 54th description of Babylon the Great is a three-pronged fork of the same event. So let me explain this first about the Gog-Magog War that the Bible says is a coalition of nations that someday will attack Israel. Now, for those unaware of this coming battle, uh, we, need to, we need to kind of build a foundation. So, so Pastor Jack Hibbs is going to take it once we build the foundation. But there's a group of nations that, according to Ezekiel, will attack Israel in the future. It's found in Ezekiel 38, 2, verse 8. It says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, this is Ezekiel prophesying from ancient Babylon. And say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now, in the New Testament, in Ephesians 6, it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. When he says princes in this verse, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, he's talking to a hierarchy of demonic spirits. You know, Daniel fasted for 21 days. And the Bible says that an angel came to Daniel and said that the prince of Persia withstood me. And then Daniel called him my prince Michael, which is the prince of 
the principality, the, the, the guardian angel over Israel. Now, when that, when that guardian angel left Daniel, he said, I have to go fight the prince of Grisha. So now we're talking about the prince of Israel, which is Michael, the prince of Grisha, and the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So from this premise, we have to understand that God is saying that these spirits will manipulate leadership to fulfill his will in the Gog Magog war. This is very important. The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, or Gog, as he's called, it doesn't matter who's in leadership at this, the appointed time that Israel comes down. It might be Putin, it might not be Putin, but who is ever in control of Russia at the appointed time, that spirit is going to manipulate him, put an evil thought in his mind to come down and attack Israel. Now, this is because Jeremiah says that God is watching over his word to perform it. Whatever this book says is exactly what God is going to do. It's not my word. It's not your word. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's not my interpretation. It's not your interpretation, but it's God's word. It's God's opinion, and it's God's interpretation. And in Deuteronomy 29, he says, I have spoken it. I will also do it. I have purposed it, and I will also bring it to pass. Now, Pastor Jack and I will be talking about this war that is coming. So here are some scriptures to preface the conversation. Ezekiel 38, 4 says, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy, into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine enemy, and all thy horsemen, now he's talking to Gog and Magog and the chief prince of Tubal and Meshach, or Meshach. And he will bring a great company with bucklers and shields. Now he names, he names the ethnic groups that are going to join the spirits going to mis, uh, manipulate. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and his bands, the house of Togomar, and the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Now, when you look at scripture and what ethnologists tell us, those particular families or ethnic groups are right now where Russia is. Russia is Magog, Iran is Persia. Ethiopia is Ethiopia, Turkey is Togomar, Libya is Libya, Gomer, they believe, is a, is a region of Germany or somewhere in there. Now, Ezekiel 9, 6 says, I'm against the Ogog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, but I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Now, as those nations come down to attack Israel, there's going to be a group of allied nations that respond. And Ezekiel 39, 13 says, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Are thou come to take a spoil? Now, those geographical regions today, according to ethnologists, is Saudi Arabia, which is Sheba and Dedan, Britain and Spain, which is the land of Tarshish, and the young lions would include the USA, Canada, and the Commonwealth nations that came out of Britain and Spain. So here's the preface of what most in, uh, people interpret as the players in the Gog Magog War. Now from here, we go to Pastor Jack Hibbs, and we'll be back right after that interview, and we're going to make some comments from what Pastor Jack says concerning the Gog Magog War. So stay with us. We'll be right back. We're just warning you that something's coming, something big. It's global. It's Bible. He has spoken it. 
He will also do it. He has purposed it and he will bring it to pass. When you get into prophecy, God forewarns you of the mm -hmm. coming judgment. And he also forewarns you of the coming wrath, which, which brings us to a chapter that, that you and I are, are right in line with in our interpretations. You mentioned that the war in Ukraine could lead to the Gog-Magog War when several nations, including Russia, Iran, Turkey, which, by the way, have already formed a coalition, yep. they attack Israel with about four or five other nations. And this is what yep. you state in your book, uh, Pastor Jack. Bible scholars agree that this failed attack by Russia and its allies, as outlined in Ezekiel 38, will take place either just before the rapture of the church or just after the rapture. Now, here's the question. Mm -hmm. If the rapture is pre-tribulation, which my wife and I have studied everything, and we're standing, we are voting pre-tribulation rapture from the verses that we've got in the Bible. Right. If the rap when this war takes place, it's at the beginning of the tribulation, correct? That's correct. I believe so. Yeah. Yes. Could the rapture happen during this war? And the end of this war is a burning fiery furnace. And it says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 8, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking mm -hmm. vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could, could this event of the Gog-Magog war, you you equate it with the rapture, could this thing all be wrapped up in, in one thing and it happens right during that war? Can you see that happening? Well, we know this about the Ezekiel battle is that it is extremely quick. It is extremely yes. fast. Even, even though it's in a mass of some five, possibly maybe six nations, but predominantly five coming against Israel. Whatever happens, remember, you know this well, Rick, they, the invading armies, they make it to what looks like uh, maybe Mount Hermon, yes. maybe not even, not, not even the, uh, the Galilee region. Uh, it looks like Mount Hermon. Why? They come out of the north. It says so. And it says that five sixths of the invading army is going to be destroyed by the hand of God. Whatever by goes fire. on. But By exactly, it's going to be extremely fast, extremely quick. And I personally believe that it's at such the proximity of the opening throes of the tribulation period that, and, and, and this, I believe, because of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that I believe the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is removed. I believe yes. the Holy Spirit will step aside as he delivers, as it were, the church up to the hands of Christ in John 14. That said, in that proximity, things could start off real quick. And um, it's going to move very, very fast. We know from Ezekiel 38 that when that event takes place, it says, then Israel, there will be an awakening in Israel. The Bible says that the Jews will begin to believe in God again which is interesting. Right now, you've been to Israel, Rick. You go there, and it's shocking to meet Jews. They say they're Jews, which is hilarious to me because they'll tell you in the next breath, I don't believe in God. I thought you said you were a Jew. I am. But you don't believe in God? The word Jew means to praise God, to be a praiser of God. Well, I don't believe in God because where was he in the Holocaust? He abandoned us. Yes. Oh, so the truth is, yes. the truth is, you do believe in God. You just don't like the way that he's handling things. Well, their, their attention is going to get grabbed by God in this Ezekiel battle. I encourage your viewers to read Ezekiel 37 and 8. Eight. And watch. And nine. And nine, because nine is the mop-up. Yeah. I mean, nine is the cleanup. Yes. And isn't it interesting, Rick, that it says that the materials that Israel cleans up uh, they'll, they will use for power. They will use for energy for seven years, it says.
Folks, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Pastor Jack Hibbs. But at this point, I would like to add that pro, uh, traditional prophecy teachers all teach about the Gog Magog War. And Pastor Jack and I agree it is at the beginning of the tribulation when this war is going to take place. However, this is where Prophecy USA goes away from traditional teaching. One of the protocols we try to maintain in our ministry is this. If the Bible doesn't say it, neither will we. Now, at the climax of this war, we discover another nation who dwells carelessly in the isles will also be judged by fire at the same time Gog and Magog are judged. It says that thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, it's talking to Gog and Magog, and thy bands and the people that is with thee. And I will send fire on Magog and among them who dwell carelessly in the isles or the coastlands. Now, Jeremiah 51, 27 tells us that in the latter days, Babylon, who's a latter-day nation, the same as Russia and Turkey and Iran, Babylon, who has 53 biblical descriptions in the U.S., has fulfilled every description. She dwells carelessly, Jeremiah 51, 27, and she also will be destroyed by fire. Now, that fire will come from three different nations who are in coalition together. And according to Scripture, that fire will come from Russia, Turkey, and Iran, which are the same coalition of nations who attack Israel in the Gog Magog War. Now look at this in Isaiah 47. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures that dwellest carelessly. This is Isaiah talking about Babylon who dwells carelessly, who says in her heart, I am and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. The USA has 12,000 miles of coastland. 40% of the world's seaports are in the U.S. Now Jeremiah 5127 says, prepare the nations against Babylon, against her. Call together against her the kingdoms of Arat and Mini, which is Turkey, Askenaz, which is Russia, and prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes, which is Iran. And the land shall tremble and sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon, to make the land of Babylon a desolation. Now, most of you who have followed Prophecy USA are quite aware that there are multiple scriptures that describe the 54th description of Babylon's fiery judgment. Now, remember, Iran, Turkey, and Russia are part of the coalition that come down on Israel. So what we're looking at is a preemptive strike on the United States of America as that war takes place. And the fiery judgment that comes on Babylon is mentioned over eight times. Babylon's destruction by fire is in Revelation 18.8. 8. She shall be utterly burned by fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. Remember, God also burns Gog and Magog. But at the same time, he burns those who dwell carelessly in the isles. Revelation 18.10, for in one hour thy judgment is come, Babylon. Revelation 18.17, for in one hour so great riches come to naught. And the shipmasters and all the company in the ships and sailors and as many trade by sea stood afar off and they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city of Babylon? Now note, this is not a religious organization that is judged. It's a city, a population center. Babylon is called a great city or a mighty city no less than eight times in Scripture. So the preceding chapter 17 is where most people derive the concept that the lady Babylon is some type of religious organization because she's dressed in purple and scarlet.
And they say that's referencing religious robes. Well, that's a stretch because purple and red also represent riches and power. So this woman, this Babylon, is a great city, a great population center. Revelation 18, 19 says that, and they will cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing, saying, alas, that great city were in, were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she's made desolate. Remember, she who dwells carelessly in the coastlands will be burned with Gog and Magog. Now, Revelation 14, 7 says, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains and waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Fallen is Babylon, Babylon is fallen, fallen, that great city. Isaiah 47, 5, 11 also says the, same th says, says the same thing about Babylon. Now, here is a time sequence that ties the Gog-Magog war, which is when the Antichrist spirit attacks Israel. Revelation 17, 16 says that there will be ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast who shall hate the woman, hate Babylon, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall burn her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God be fulfilled. Now this is talking about the Antichrist spirit working through the nations, the beast system, to destroy Babylon. Remember, the Antichrist spirit attacks Israel. At the same time, those nations will converge to take out Babylon because they hate her. So the time of Babylon's judgment on earth will take place immediately before the Antichrist takes power over the earth. Now we know that the spirit that attacks Israel is the Antichrist spirit. It will be at the beginning of the tribulation where we pinpoint the Gog-Magog war. Now look at this. Immediately after Babylon is judged, the marriage of the supper, the marriage of the lamb begins in heaven. And this marriage or this supper lasts throughout the seven-year tribulation period. Revelation 19, 1 through 7 says, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged Babylon, the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Let us rejoice and be glad and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, immediately after the Gog-Magog war, Scripture says that they will burn the weapons for seven years, which is how long the tribulation lasts. It's also the time of Jacob's captivity. Meanwhile, up in heaven, the marriage of the Lamb has come. Now, how did the people get from the ground up into heaven? How did the marriage of the Lamb begin if the church on the earth did not get up there into heaven? Ezekiel 39 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, after Gog and Magog is judged, now I will bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and we will be jealous for my holy name. This is the time of the tribulation on earth, which Jeremiah called Jacob's sorrow, which Jesus referred to in Matthew 24 as a time of tribulation which the world has never seen before. So here we have the Gog-Magog war, Gog and Magog is judged. They who judge, uh, at the same time, God judges Babylon, who dwells carelessly in the coastlines. It's at the beginning of the tribulation. And then immediately after the judgment takes place, the marriage of the Lamb has come. 
So we see all of these events happening at once, instantaneously. Rapid succession prophecy taking place, multiple prophecies being fulfilled literally in an hour. That's how Prophecy USA is interpreting these scriptures. So now, after this brief advertisement, we're going to bring you Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and he's going to explain to us from a Jewish perspective what he sees happening currently in America as she looks like she's becoming as Sodom and Gomorrah. And you are there. Stay with us right after this advertisement. In 2019, Prophecy USA showcased biblical warnings of the coming New World Order. In 2020, we warned you of their plans to use COVID-19 to accelerate that agenda. In 2021, we warned of the Babylonian spirits who were invading our nation to provoke curses upon the land, emulating Sodom and Gomorrah. But what is next? Prophecy USA is proud to present The Coming Exodus, Unveiling America's Future. In this exciting book, you will discover where traditional theologians have missed the mark and why prophecy teachers have refused to acknowledge that America's role in Bible prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled. When you give a donation of $35 or more, you will receive The Coming Exodus, Unveiling America's Future. Or for a donation of just $60 or more, you will receive both books, The Coming Exodus and The Hour That Changes Everything. Call 1-888-306-1759 or visit us online at prophecyusa.org. Could you explain to us who the Enchantress is? So of course, understand everybody who's, well, you know, that we can only take, you know, I can give you a taste of what's in the return of the gods, and I'm, I want to give you a good taste of it, but there's so much, but I'll, get, I'll give you a taste of this. The second one is actually appears in the Bible, like the first, and it's a she, it's a goddess, and the Bible calls her Ashtorah. And she was she was actually seen as the wife of Baal in in the mythology or the mistress of Baal. But she's all over. This is one of the most ancient principalities ever. And in, in fact, in Babylon, they called Ashtora. They called her Ishtar. In Greece, in, they, the Greeks called her Aphrodite. Later on, and later on, the Romans called her Venus. But you know, we think, oh, that's kind of a, you know the goddess of love. No, no, no. This, this is a dark principality. This is the goddess or the principality of sexual immorality, of sexual unbridled lust. This is the goddess who sexualized pagan culture, and this is the goddess. She's actually a harlot. She's actually a prostitute. And think, so, so what does a prostitute do? A prostitute takes sex out of the sacred bonds of marriage and puts it into the marketplace, puts it into the culture. Well, that's what she did back then. She sexualized the culture. I mean, her, you know, you could go to her temples and there was sex being performed. It was, you know, well, that was never part of Western civilization until, I mean, in my, in my, until we turned away from God. Look what happened. Look what happened right after, you know, you have, the Bible says Baal, and then second, it says Ashtorah. It happened like clockwork. First comes Baal, the turning away from God. Then comes Ashtorah. So what would we expect to happen? We'd expect there to be a, a change, a revolution in the realm of sexuality. So look what happens like clockwork. First comes the turning. Then on the, in the 1960s, the sexual revolution. What is the sexual revolution? You know, they say, oh, this is progressive. It's not progressive, it's regressive. Every change was a change away from biblical values concerning sexuality and marriage and replacing them with pagan values. These are pagan. This is not new. It's paganism. So you have that happening. But also, what else does a prostitute do? A prostitute weakens marriage. So look at what has happened to marriage in the West. Which is, a, which is covenant, which is a covenant between yeah. a man and a woman. So they're not only breaking covenant in the nation with God, but people are breaking covenant with each other. Is that correct? Yes, yes because this, exactly, Rick, this principality, specifically, she was promiscuous, she was an adulteress, she was a prostitute, she warred against the marriage covenant. So as you take sexuality from marriage and put it and spread it into the culture, you also weaken marriage. And so there's no there's no accident that at the same moment you have the sexual revolution, you have the weakening and destroying of marriages, destroying of homes. It's all has the fingerprints prints of this goddess. And let me tell you something Rick, about this. And that is that that, you know, she was worshipped 
And the Greeks worshipped her as the sacred prostitute. Well, the word for prostitute that they called her in Greek, though, is the word porne, from which we get the word porn. Pornography. Pornography. And it's no accident because this goddess is actually, in a sense, the inventor of pornography. The very first pornography on planet Earth are the writings concerning this goddess. In fact, pornography means the writings of the goddess, or the writings, the writings of the prostitute, and this was, this was the goddess. And so, so basically, she seduces a culture, addicts a culture, pornifies a culture through pornography and, and seduce it. So, so her job or her mission is to take a Christian culture or civilization and turn it into a pagan one by using the realm of sexuality. And let me give you one other thing about this. There's a word in Greek, you know, we all, well, we use it in English, erotic, erotic culture, eroticism. Yes. Well, it comes from the Greek word eros. Eros was a god, and you know, you know who the mother of who, the mother who gave birth to Eros? This goddess. So from this goddess comes pornography, comes erotica, comes the 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 sexualization of our culture. It has not stopped. It began in the 60s, has not stopped unto this day. And the origin of these gods, according to the way we understand it, it all began in ancient Babylon, did it not? Where they first oh, ancient appeared? Babylon is ancient Babylon is central. Um, you know, you have you kind of have two centers. You have Egypt on one hand. You have, but these gods, particularly, yes, Mesopotamia, Ur, um, Sumer, and Babylon, Babylon, Akkad. That was it. And so when you look at this god, by the way, this goddess was very big in Babylon. That's and most of but most people, even though they don't know a lot about it, will have heard the word Ishtar. That is the that is that is one of her original names, you know. But the but she also went to Israel, and so God and God speaks about this. This was part of the fall of Israel, it's part of the fall of exactly. the West right now. But yes, absolutely. The Babylon, some of the in the Return of the Gods, I actually use some of the inscriptions that were found in Mesopotamia, in Babylon, in Sumer to show you how, I mean, it, it's amazing how what is written back then are actually affecting us right now. It's the issue of our time. The Enchantress or the Transformer was that goddess, you know, who turned men into women, actually was the goddess of parades. And she actually, I, I put it into the Return of the Gods. You actually see the inscriptions. It says, the people of Sumer parade before you. She made the people parade. Now, what kind of parades did they have? The parades they had were she, she caused men to parade in the city streets dressed up as women, women in the city streets parading as men. It, the, parade, the parades were filled with color. They were filled with licentiousness and with the bending of gender. Does that sound familiar? Well, they're yes. back. Um, that's number one. Number two, here, here, she actually claimed one month of the year where she especially possessed the culture. And you know that when I looked, Rick, at the original writings of the early Christians, and and because it was still happening back then, uh, and I looked at the writings of Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome identifies the month of item parades, processions. But you know what it was, and gender. You know what it was. No it's idea. the month of he calls it Iunium or or in in Latin Junium or the month of June. Well, June has returned to what to its pagan form. You know, remember. Jesus said that the spirits go back to the house they have. Well, the, this goddess possessed June. She's gone back to that house. And do you know what one of one of the key signs of this goddess was? Was the, uh, this is and listen, this is right there in the in the Sumerian uh, inscriptions. It's there. Was the sign of the rainbow. So it's no accident what we're seeing now. And I will so I will even tell you how how. How big this is that it's even affected the Supreme Court in America. Example, there were three decisions by the Supreme Court that changed marriage, changed sexuality, ended with the famous uh, 2015 when marriage was redefined forever. Well, it started in 2003, three decisions over 12 years. Um, so here's the thing. Every one of them took place in June. In the, in, the, in the specific time of June, near the summer solstice, which is the time of the goddess, each one took place on June 26th, the same exact day, and that the date was linked to the goddess, and not that the Supreme Court knew what it was doing, it just happened. But on top of it, if you remember the day when the light, when the when President Obama lit up the yes. White House as a rainbow yes. to celebrate marriage, well, you know what? That night on the ancient calendar, but the biblical calendar and the Babylonian calendar was the 10th day of the month of Tammuz. The 10th of Tammuz. By the way, 
the Tammuz, the, the, the name Tammuz is already linked to the goddess. It was part of her mythology. I won't even go into it. But the 10th of Tammuz, I, I, I found a Babylonian inscription that said that day is appointed to cast a spell to cause a man to love a man. That was the day that marriage was changed. Folks, we do not think that it's a coincidence that when mentioning the rapture of the church, Jesus specifically said that it would be just as the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be when the Son of Man is revealed. The earth is going to look, or Babylon is going to look, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Imagine that, folks. Jeremiah and Isaiah, centuries before Jesus made that statement, told us that Babylon the Great would not only act like Sodom and Gomorrah, but she would be judged like Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaiah 13, 19 says, And Babylon, the kingdom, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeas exile, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Jeremiah 51, after Russia, Iran, and Turkey burn Babylon, this is how it looks in Jeremiah 50, 40. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. So now, once again, our panel of experts today are not advocating that America is Babylon the Great, but they've been gracious enough to come onto our program and meet us on common ground concerning the Gog Magog War, the guaranteed judgment of America if she does not repent, and the pre-tribulation rapture that could be right around the corner. So we're honored to have these scholars join us today. So now, let's look at the final exodus in Scripture that is explained from a Jewish perspective as we listen to Rabbi Jason Sobel explain what the rapture will look like. Yeah, and I, I'm reminded of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with ever with the Lord. Now, uh, Deuteronomy, I, I want to... I wanna, just this last question, I want to tie this all together. Um, you state that Deuteronomy 18 and 34, when read together, unlock the most important reasons the Torah was written to point to the prophet like Moses, but also the Messiah who would bring a greater exodus. What is the greater exodus that you're talking about? What is the mystery behind the greater exodus? Yeah, the, the the greater the greater exodus is the second coming of the Messiah, at which point we will be caught up to meet with him. He will regather his people to himself and will experience the fullness of the redemption that he has for us, because the sound of the shofar is meant to be the sound of change and transformation. Right. And so when you think about the sound of the shofar, it's associated with the Feast of Trumpets, the Jewish New Year, known as Rosh Hashanah. Right. Well, Rosh Hashanah on the biblical calendar, the day the shofar sounded is the day Joseph was released from prison to the palace. It's the day that Israel's slave labor in Egypt stopped. They weren't freed until passover in the spring but we think of the 10 plagues ha happening very quickly no it actually happened over almost a year's time okay and so there's the plagues did yeah the plagues in egypt did according to the biblical it was over one year yeah almost a year because there was the warning to pharaoh then there was the waiting 
then there was the judgment, then there was the waiting. So God gave a, a long period of time for the Egyptians to repent because God is gracious and compassionate, and he wanted them to be redemptive, not punitive. But they didn't heed it, right? But no. all that happened on Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah was a time of freedom. It's a time of release. It's the time of change and transformation, right? And the ultimate change and transformation is when the Lord returns, the shofar is sound, and in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed, right? And that is meant to instill hope in our hearts because hope is the belief that our future is going to be better than our past. And so the sound of the shofar reminds us of the ultimate hope, the blessed hope, the coming of Messiah, when he comes as fulfillment of the greater than Moses, he leads a new exodus, he leads us from this world into the kingdom of God, from ultimately death into life, from a decaying body into a transformed one, to a resurrected one, and ultimately God's promises of redemption that we see pictured with Moses, pictured in the exodus, ultimately will fulfill fulfilled when he returns as the greater than Moses leading the final exodus. Do you think it's possible that God might give us the same type of signs and wonders that he gave Egypt before he, he, he lets this world go into the tribulation, which is a seven-year judgment and wrath of God? But do you think it's possible the Old Testament anointing could come upon the New Testament church for, for a, a short period of time as a final warning? Is that is that in Scripture? I, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I think that absolutely. I mean, I think on a number of different levels. I mean, I think Yeshua, Jesus said, greater things than these you will do. That's one thing. It also says in the prophet Micah, as it, uh, I will once again show you signs and wonders as in the days I brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. Jeremiah 16 says, therefore, the days are coming quickly, declares Adonai, will no, it, will, it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but rather as Adonai lives who brought the children of Israel from the lands of the north, from all the lands where he had banished them. So there's lots of scriptures that show that you know, in preparation to the coming redemption, leading up to it, there are going to be miracles like there was in the days of the coming forth out of the land of Egypt. I, I, absolutely. I believe we're going to see them that, experience them. Yeah. That's exactly what Oral Roberts said. His ministry was a forerunner of signs and wonders that would come before the second coming. And, you know, you know I, uh, I had an encounter with the Lord and the Lord spoke to me from, he said, the greatest revival that the world has ever seen is coming, but it's not rooted in fear it's rooted in love and a demonstrating demonstration of his goodness with supernatural healing and transformation for the world to see that will turn people's hearts towards him so i absolutely believe that that is one of the keys to prepare for the return of the messiah Folks, we hope you've enjoyed our interviews with Pastor Jack Hibbs, Rabbi J Jonathan Kahn, and Rabbi Jason Sobel. In summary, I would like to say that Pastor Hibbs believes the Gog-Magog War will take place before the tribulation begins. Now, some believe that America will be diminished before that war takes place, but Prophecy USA believes America will be one of the young lions of Tarshish who stand with Israel during that war. And at that time, she will be diminished in one hour by fire, fulfilling her role in Bible prophecy as the lady of kingdoms called Babylon the Great, who becomes fallen and looks like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we have no less than 10 verses describing that fiery judgment. Seven are in the book of Revelation, 
One is in Jeremiah 51, 27. One is in Isaiah 47, 5 through 11. And one is in Ezekiel 39 and 7, she who dwells carelessly in the isles. So we have no less than eight references of this city called Babylon being a city. Babylon is not a religious organization. She is not the Catholic Church. But the spirits that are manifesting their, their uh, disobedience through people, those Babylonian spirits will exist not only now, but once commercial Babylon's gone, they will exist throughout the tribulation and form a religious system. But Babylon itself is a city, a nation. Now, unfortunately, the fact that America has sacrificed 20% of her population to Baal, and she now looks more like Sodom and Gomorrah than the lady of kingdoms whose God has raised up, she will see her last day of dominion during that war, the Gog-Magog war, as God deposes her as well as those who attack Israel. Now, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn in his book, The Josiah Factor, has warned us, unless America turns back to God, that judgment is not only possible, it's inevitable. So we join our hearts with Rabbi praying for God to move his hand in this great nation, both in the USA and in Canada, because without a sovereign move of God's spirit in our nation, according to Rabbi, our nation is doomed. Now, finally, Rabbi Jason Sobel confirms that just like Moses led the children of Israel in the exodus to deliver God's people, a much greater exodus is coming. It will be bigger it will be better, and it will be the most spectacular event in human history. As the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise, and we who are alive will be caught up in the twinkling of an eye, probably in the midst of a fiery furnace, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that rapture, or exodus, is described as being a day when fire falls in Luke 21:36. As we talked, Jesus said that. Also in 2 Thessalonians 1 7, we want to encourage you as Paul did. To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, folks, nobody knows the hour of that event. And in the meantime, we're called to be the best that we can be. Let Christ be the center of your being. Be kind one to another, ready to help, ready to serve, ready to make somebody's day a little more pleasurable because God loves them and so should we. So we want to thank all of you who are supporting this ministry both prayerfully and financially. And we promise you, Prophecy USA will continue to root out, pull down, and destroy every thought and doctrine of devils that are keeping the body of Christ in darkness by stating that America is nowhere to be found in Bible prophecy. Folks, we were raised up for such a time as this to deliver the 53 descriptions of Babylon the Great. So let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In these last days, folks, we're at the end of the end of the last days. But we're out of time. My name is Rick Pearson. I'm reminding you that God is in full control, folks. Jesus is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. We'll see you next week on Prophecy USA. And we want to thank our guests for sharing from their hearts what they have learned in this great book that we call the Holy Bible. See you next week. Shalom.